What's up, everybody? Aura L of Vinu here with Fully Deconverted, and today we're going to be speaking with Tracy Harris of the Atheist Experience. But before we do, if you want to learn more about Fully Deconverted, you can head over to fullydeconverted.com, and from there you can check out all our social media sites. And if you want to be involved in some great discussion on facts and faith, no matter what side of the fence you're on, make sure to check out our Facebook group fully deconverted because there you're going to find some very intriguing conversation with a lot of like-minded people almost no matter what background you come from all right now moving over to tracy harris tracy how are you doing and um let's start off with a question here we go in the ancient biblical literature story of genesis why was it that eve was the one who was deceived and was the catalyst for the fall of all humankind. Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> wow. Um, let's see, that's a really old story and I'm not super familiar with like the roots of it before it gets into the Judeo-Christian tradition. So I think that's an awesome question. The answer is I could probably research it and get a correct answer. And it definitely, I mean, it definitely speaks to a cultural bias against women. I mean, there's yeah. no doubt yeah. that you're talking about a culture that kind of holds women in low esteem, that they are, because Adam seems to be the sort of unwitting, you know, mm. he, he's the unwitting dupe of this thing, even though he's the one that was told not to eat it, right? Yeah. I mean, he was told specifically by God, don't do this. And yet Eve comes to him and says, I ate it and I didn't die. So have some. And somehow she's sort of portrayed as the more witting partner in this, right? So she makes a decision, she reasons it out talking to the serpent, and she makes a, a thoughtful decision to do this. And then she just sort of gives it to Adam, who his defense is, well, she gave it to me. <laughs> I mean, that's his yeah. reasoning. So it, I, it, it kind of speaks to a lot of interesting things, really, about the idea of uh, the concept of women as conniving, right? And and what's interesting is when you look at very patriarchal cultures, mm. a lot of times women have to be conniving. So I don't know if that has something to do with it or not, but women don't have overt power in those cultures, right? They don't own the resources or means yeah. of production or anything like that. And so women get all of their power through manipulation of men in a system like that, which means that you have to be able to sort of manipulate people to think about your actions, how to control others, how to get what you want by convincing someone else to give you access to it, as opposed to being able to go and get it directly by yourself. Tracy, okay, so to what extent then do you think that patriarchal culture has influenced the behaviors of women and the culture of women worldwide? Oh, I think it's huge. I mean, when you look at literature, for example, especially, I mean, we're talking Western lit, which because of colonialization uh, is fairly global. I mean, mm. the Europe and the UK and, you know, basically went out, colonized the rest of the world, uh, whipped all the other cultures into their model of, of cultural reality, right? Like through their, threw down their uh, models of marriage, threw down their models of laws, threw down their yeah. models. So they basically force fit their structure onto everything else. So when you're talking about, you know, the Western civilization and the patriarchy in that situation, or, and, and I mean, if, if some people recoil, if somebody hears this and they, they have a problem with the term patriarchy, it's just about what I'm talking about is the idea of, of men mainly controlling resources, which yeah. historically that was the reality. But when you look at European literature, it's full of examples of women who are behind the scenes sort of manipulating things and manipulating their husbands. First of all, you get um, mostly main characters that are men, right, with these women mm -hmm. sort of as the, the sort of secondary characters in the lit. And I yeah. think, you know, art follows reality. So when you have this culture and you've got these books, they're basically mimicking this situation that's really happening. Otherwise, no one would relate to them. They would say this is too fantastical and no one lives this way. Yeah. But a lot of times you have situations where in the, in the literature, um, and this is, you know, you're going to find examples in Russian literature. You're going to find examples in French literature. You're going to find it of women who are manipulating men 
uh, when it's a female character that is a lead, like Madame Bovary or something like that, you know, she, you have these tragic characters. I think there's, um, I, I want to say it's Anna Karenina, but it's been a while since I've done this reading. But in one situation, there was an author who wrote the ending where she actually empowers herself and leaves her husband, right? Mm. She says, you're this and she walks. And that ending was so scandalous that it had to be altered when it was done on stage and adapted for plays that she returns <laughs> and begs for forgiveness and comes back to him and says she's sorry. Um, and, you know, so it's, it's interesting the way that the culture couldn't even deal with the ending where a woman just says, I'm leaving. Like yeah. that was too much for them. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah that's, that's interesting. And, and now that you, you mentioned that, I mean, I kind of thought that and I even got a question on, uh, the issue further on patriarchy uh, here for you, but um, yeah, some interesting insight. Um, let me ask you this then. So how important is it that there are prominent female persons in the political landscape? You know, that's an interesting question because at the end of the day, I prefer somebody who represents my views yeah. whether or not they share my gender. Mm. But I do think there is something to be said for the idea that someone who shares your experience is going to more than likely, mo more often fall into the category of someone who can represent your views. Mm. So the example that I like to use is, I in no way was represented by a candidate like Sarah Palin. Mm. She in no way represents my views or my interests, or even in my opinion, my best you know, my best interest. She's not yeah. looking out for me and what I consider to be important to myself as a woman. But here you have a situation where a two-term president, a black male, right? Black man mm -hmm. was a better representative for my interests as a woman in this society than any of the other candidates. So I'm identifying with this person who demographically could probably not be more different than me. And yeah. yet I would prefer him to somebody who's simply just female or woman, you know? And so when it comes down to it, I think, you know, do I, do I think that the, that a representation is important? Yes. I think there's a problem when you have almost half your population or in, you know, some people estimating a little bit more than half the population being women and just a small percentage being representatives in government when they can take a picture of Congress and it just like, looks like, you know, the white male convention. Yeah. That's a problem. We live in a society that needs to be, it should be at least representative of the population in, yeah. just because you would expect that, right? The fact that it's not being represented, I think speaks to at least the reality that there's a lack of empowerment among certain demographics, that they should mm. be more empowered. And I think with women being half the population or you know, slightly more than half the population in some estimates, that there, there should be more empowerment than, than is represented when you look at levels of power in the society. And I don't think that women are unique in this. I think most minorities probably have the same situation because you're not going to snap your fingers and just magically wave a wand and, and change the percentages of, of power, right? right. One, of the, one of the great conversations that I heard um, recently was on a program where they had like a black community leader who's talking about how um, black citizens in the US do not have positions within, the, uh, with, within our capitalistic society where they're actually controlling the production, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a lot, of, and, and when you hear the conversations, after I heard that dialogue, and I would hear these conversations of politicians arguing about black employment rates, after hearing somebody talk about how, yes, it's great to have a job, but wouldn't it be better if they were the people hiring, if they were mm -hmm. hiring people for their company, if they were a black CEO, if they were a black business owner, and that's what's lacking, right? And that's important. Because it's not just about working for somebody. There's a lot to be said for owning the means of production and, to, and for being somewhere on that level where you're actually doing the hiring and firing and where these are your employees and where this is your product and where you actually own it, not just produce it for someone else. And yeah, right now, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so, so that's easy to say, Tracy. Um, but it then how, do you, how does a minority like a woman 
in position of power or politics actually then make that change? And what are the realistic expectations then? Because you're not just going to snap your fingers right and then all of a sudden um, Congress well, is half women. That's the problem, right? Is how to how to go about implementing that change. Like you, it's, you're right. It's easy to look at the demographics and say this is not. There's a problem here. There's a problem when it's not just that somebody <laughs> that black people don't want power, right? Black <laughs> people don't want to be represented in government. Black we all want people, power. You know, and, yeah, I would definitely not just make the assumption that well, they're not in government because you know they just don't care about what happens to them. They don't care mm. about the the policies that control their lives. I think that people do care about. Well, first of all, getting people to care about the policies that control their lives is important. But it's more difficult to get a person to care about the policies that control their lives when they feel un like disempowered. So, OK, so speaking on just, that. Yeah. Sp speaking on people feeling like they don't have power. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that some people then are silent, waiting for somebody to stand up for their cause? Well, don't you think you see that all the time? Yeah, I do. Right? I yeah. mean, all the time. People, there's a, a quote that I heard recently that was, um, courage is contagious. Oh. Right? And, and that's what it represents, what you just said. It's the idea that nobody stands up and then one person stands up and suddenly everybody stands up. Oh, right? Tracy. So, all right. So I got a great formula for this. I heard okay. this thing and, and, and I want to see if you agree with me. So courage is contagious. So you get the first person to stand up and they do the thing, right? But they don't have a follower yet. And it only takes one person to get behind that person where everybody else can see. And then as soon as that one follower happens, they are actually the catalyst for change. What do you think about that? I, I don't think that that's without merit, right? I, I do think that it, it, that's what happens, right? So we had, for example, look what happened to Brennan in the, in the Intel community. So Brennan gets mm. his security clearance stripped. Yeah. And then you have... You know, someone else stands up and says, strip my security clearance, yeah. right? Take mine. And it, and, it, and it was like, wow. So this person is standing up and saying in, in response to seeing this intelligence, retired intelligence agent official have a security clearance stripped, I'm going to stand in solidarity and I'm going to say strip my clearance. And by the end of the week, you had 175 ambassadors and intel agents and you know standing up and saying we all take our security it's like it was so amazing the the oh, wow. the way that people immediately rolled out when someone stood up in solidarity with the person who was being persecuted hold on tracy so are you saying are you saying that um christianity could have took off way more had peter actually not denied christ I don't know because I don't know if that even happened. I mean, you're talking about a Bible story, so I mean, these are yeah. these are stories. I mean, they but, could have made um, the story like uh, way way better if they like. And then Peter was right there along with him, and that's how we got it today. Yeah, I guess you could have, but the narrative, I suppose, was about you know him being isolated and alone, and this this lone figure facing yeah. this fate. I mean, there's whole, all kinds of reasons why the myths are are what they are, but. Um, yeah, the, it's. A, have you ever seen? There's a little uh, documentary film called Kumare. No, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's uh, just real quickly. It's a guy who decides to build his own guru cult, and it's it's real. It's not just. It's not a fiction. Right. So the guy decides he's going to build his own guru cult, um, and he does it in reaction to thinking that guru cults are are crap. Right? He thinks this is all garbage. He comes from an Indian background. He looked into it, decided this is ridiculous. And then he was like, anyone could do this. I could do this. But people don't need to be led. They need to be taught to lead themselves. Mm -hmm. And so he starts a little cult where he, he make, literally makes his little mantra, like, be your own guru. So he's the guru who's going to gain followers to tell them to be their own guru. And ultimately, he hires two people. One is a marketing strategist, some kind of publicist, and the other one is a follower. It's like you're saying, he hires this person to be a follower. So she comes and says, oh, he's awesome. I'm like his number one apostle, right, whatever. And she promotes this as I'm a follower. I've been following him, blah. And they make up sort of this history, like he actually was a guru in India. And it's amazing how fast he is able to book uh, like gigs and how people start showing up and then a couple people like him and so they come to his next thing and they invite their friends and 
even if a ton of people that come to see him don't show up, the numbers of people who do start growing because everybody that likes him starts inviting their friends and then some of their yeah. friends like him. So now you've got the original layer and then you've got the next layer and you get the next. And ultimately he ends up building um, and growing this, this religion to a point where it overtakes him. It becomes bigger than what he anticipated. And then he doesn't know how to back out of it. Like something that starts out as like an experiment for him to say, I think I can do this. And I, I, I want to see if I can get people to sort of think for themselves. And he ends up finding out that a lot of people just want to be led. And then they start yeah. relying on him and view him as this real religious leader. And he doesn't know how to, it, it grows bigger than him. Yeah. And I think there's a lesson there too, right? That, um, that even if this isn't your plan, sometimes a, a movement that you start or something that you begin or that you might have an idea and sometimes that idea becomes larger than you and you lose control of it. <laughs>